Okay, welcome to another tutorial video. We're going to focus on return on equity or ROE here. Now we've already covered a few other returns metrics like return on assets and return on invested capital. So I thought we might finish off the series. So as usual with this topic, there's a lot of junk out there that presents the definitions and the calculations, but doesn't really get to the heart of the matter, which is that return on equity is useful in basically three industries, commercial banks, insurance, and regulated utility companies. And the way you use it is, in the case of commercial banks and insurance, it is a way to check your work and assess the relative valuations of different companies. If you're modeling a utility company though, then it acts as a key model driver and something that determines the net income that the utility company can earn and eventually even their revenue and the rates they can charge customers. If you want this tutorial in writing, along with the screenshots, the Excel examples, also the PDFs and the extracts from filings here, you can go to this URL. It's pretty long. So I will pin this below the video, but go to our financial statement analysis page and then return on equity. Again, I'll link to this URL below the video and pin it as the first comment. So I'm going to start by giving you the two minute answer here. And then if you want more detail, you can keep watching and we'll go into some more of the calculations and examples. Return on equity is defined as net income in a period divided by the company's average common shareholders equity over that same period. Net income is just the bottom line. So the company's profit after taxes and then common shareholders equity you can think of as the company's saved up accumulated after tax earnings over the long term plus the value of the capital issued to external investors with ownership stakes otherwise known as shareholders so if you take all the company's net income over the long haul you deduct the dividends that they've issued and distributed because those are no longer saved up and then you also add in the value of the stock they issued to investors at the time they issued it if you add all these up over time, that will tell you what the common shareholders equity is. Return on equity tells you how efficiently a company is using its equity to generate after tax profits. If you are valuing a bank or insurance firm and one bank has a higher ROE than another, but it's similar in other ways, it's a similar size, it operates in a similar region, then the bank with the higher ROE should trade at a higher price to book value multiple. And you can calculate price to book value by just taking the equity value and dividing by the book value or the common shareholders equity on the balance sheet. If we take a look at the example here for JP Morgan versus Citi, JP Morgan has a return on equity anywhere between 10% and 20%. It looks like the median here is probably around 15%. Citi's is much lower. It's more in the five to 10% range. And sure enough, it is no surprise that JP Morgan has a price to book value multiple of 2X and then City has a price to book value multiple of only 0.7x. Now in the regulated utility sector, the government regulators set or determine the allowed or authorized ROE that a company can earn, and the company has to operate based on this restriction. So the ROE acts not just as a way to check valuations, but actually as a model driver in the sector. And the way it works is that there is a rate base, which is sort of like the company's total capital, there's an allowed equity percentage, and then there's an allowed ROE on that equity. If you multiply those together, that gets you the authorized net income. Then you can add back the taxes and other expenses to get to the authorized revenue and the base rates the utility can charge. So I have a short example here for this company, MGE Energy, which we'll go into in more detail in a little bit. But essentially, they disclose their rate base for their electricity segment. We can multiply by the allowed equity percentage around 55% here, multiply by the allowed return on equity of 9.8%, and that gets us the net income they're allowed to earn in a specific period. Then we can add back the taxes, we can add back the net interest expense, depreciation and amortization, and operating expenses, and that gets us to the allowed operating revenue. We can then divide by the electricity they sell, and that gets us the rates that they're allowed to charge their customers. So this is the very short answer of how you use return on equity. If you want more detail, here's the outline for the rest of the tutorial. First, I'm gonna speak briefly about why ROE matters for banks and insurance companies. We'll go through a few examples and look at the top four biggest commercial banks in the US and see how ROE and the price to book value multiple compares. And then we'll look at ROE for utilities and we'll go through that example for MGE Energy, but I will actually calculate each step of the process. ROE matters for banks and insurance firms because they generate revenue, profits, and cash flows based directly on their balance sheets. Loans are the biggest asset for banks and a key driver in all models, but a bank can't just grow its loans at 10% or 20% or 15% or some other rate 
because they need regulatory capital to back up these loans in case there are unexpected losses. And regulatory capital, we have another tutorial on, but it's basically shareholders' equity with some modifications. A bank can increase its shareholders' equity by generating net income and keeping it and not distributing it. It can also raise capital from shareholders to boost its shareholders' equity and support loan growth. And since banks are required to keep a certain amount of shareholders' equity, the return on equity measures how efficiently the bank is using its buffer capital, the shareholders' equity, to grow its after-tax profits. And this ROE metric should correlate pretty strongly with the price-to-book value multiple, or equity value divided by book value on the balance sheet. So let's start by looking at the specific calculations for JP Morgan and Citi, and then we'll do a wider comparison with some of the other banks. To calculate return on equity, we just take the net income in the period, divide by the average common shareholders equity over this period. And we could take the median. We'll focus on just the most recent five years here, although we could go back six years or 10 years or anything else. And so we get to the median here of around 15 or 16%. We see the price to book multiple of 2x. For Citi, it is the same idea. We take their net income, we divide by the average common shareholders equity. You can find this in the company's filings. You can go to Capital IQ or FactSet or other sites, or even many free sites will have this type of information. And then we can take the median here and we see their price to book multiple is much lower. Interestingly though, their PE multiple here is actually higher than JP Morgan's. So the PE result is a little bit strange, but the price to book res result is very much expected. Other metrics definitely matter, but return on equity and price to book are very, very highly correlated for commercial banks. And just to illustrate how closely correlated they are, further down the Excel file, I've calculated the numbers for the other commercial banks here, Wells Fargo and Bank of America, the top four commercial banks in the US. I've created these graphs with the price to book multiple and return on equity, and also price to earnings and return on equity. The graph for return on equity versus price to book has an R squared of about 0.99, this is almost like a textbook example of two variables that are perfectly correlated with each other. On the other hand, the graph for the return on equity and the PE multiple has basically no relationship. In fact, there's even something of an inverse relationship here, which is quite strange. So there's something very strange going on with the PE multiple, but for the price to book multiple, we see the relationship very, very closely there. If we saw something in the ordinary, so if we saw something like JP Morgan actually being valued at a price to book multiple of only 1x, that might be a sign that JP Morgan is undervalued at least at this point in time. So let's now go to the utility example. As I said before, the basic idea is that regulators set the authorized or allowed return on equity. All utility companies have a rate base that represents essentially their assets and the capital they have to back up and support those assets. It is a little bit more complicated than that because it's not just the net pp &E. There will be adjustments for deferred taxes and working capital and construction and works in progress and other things like that. But this is the basic idea and we can just go with the company's disclosed numbers to illustrate how this works. The idea overall is that regulators will look at this rate base and allow a certain percent to correspond to equity rather than debt. And then the net income equals this equity portion times the authorized ROE. So let's go to the utility example over in our Excel file right here. And for all this, I have an excerpt from this company's filing. So I've taken their rate base for their electricity segment for 2023 right here. They have the authorized return on equity of 9.8% and regulators are allowing about 55% of their capital in this electricity segment to correspond to equity. So we can take these and then calculate the authorized net income. Let's take the rate base right here we'll multiply by the common equity percentage, and then we'll take this and multiply by the 9.8% authorized return on common equity. So this is what they are allowed to earn theoretically in this period. Now you have to add back the income taxes, the net interest expense, depreciation, amortization, operating expenses, and COGS to back into the authorized revenue. And once again, I have an excerpt from the filings here that has all this broken out. Most utility companies will disclose their expenses and revenue by segment. And MGE Energy does the same thing here for the electricity segment. So I have just taken many of these numbers and input them into Excel to save a bit of time here. For the estimated pre-tax income, we are going to take their net income and divide by one minus the corporate tax rate. This will gross it up to the pre-tax income number. I'm using their net interest expense and depreciation and amortization as is. And then for the cash operating expenses and COGS, they don't exactly break it out. But if you go to their filings, you can take their total revenue 
and then you can just subtract the operating income to get both these. And then you can also subtract the depreciation and amortization to get just the cash operating expenses here. So let's go in and do this. 490.651 minus 90.991, that's the operating income. And then we'll just subtract the DNA right there. Now, when we add all these up, we get to the authorized operating revenue of about 499 million. This does not exactly match their number, but it's pretty close. They get about 491 million. So we are within a few percentage points of the actual number. Then you can calculate the base rate, which equals the authorized revenue divided by the electricity sold. You want this normally in dollars per kilowatt hour. We have the electricity sales here. Again, this is another part of their filings. All utility companies should disclose the electricity they've sold. And they have some information about the fuel supplies and the electricity sales right here. So I've just taken the numbers from right here. Let's take the authorized revenue and divide by these electricity sales. And we can see that we get a nonsensical unit here because our units are incorrect. To convert this into dollars per kilowatt hour rather than just dollars per watt hour, we have to multiply by a thousand. So we do that and we get to 0.152 right there. And if you go and look at some other sources online, you will find that customers in Wisconsin were paying electricity rates in about this range in this period. Anywhere from about 13 cents per kilowatt hour up to maybe 17 cents per kilowatt hour. So our estimate is right in the middle of that range. And again, I have some screenshots for that and examples if you look at the written version of this tutorial. Since regulators heavily restrict the return on equity that utility companies can earn, to grow, they need to either acquire more power plants or find a way to sell more power. They have to cut expenses or they can ask the government for a higher authorized return on equity or for a higher equity percentage or something else like that. So that's about it. Let's do a quick recap and summary now. ROE for financial institutions is very important because their growth is constrained by the amount of common shareholders equity on their balance sheet. To grow, they need more equity to back up their loans. The return on equity measures just how efficiently they are using that buffer capital, that shareholders equity. For banks, you saw how R squared is 0.99 when you look at the top four largest commercial banks and the relationship between return on equity and price to book. However, the relationship is much weaker. In fact, it's actually a bit of an inverse relationship when you look at the PE multiple. And then for regulated utility companies, I just walked you through this simple example for MGE Energy. The bottom line is you start with the return on equity and the rate base and the equity portion, and then you use that to back into the net income and then further back into the expenses, the revenue, and the allowed base rates. That's about it. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about this metric and how you actually use it in real life.